Chapter two. All right. So as you can see in chapter one, some basic, basic stuff. In fact, the first three chapters are as straightforward as we can get. So all this means is on the first exam, you want to take advantage of the, um, the material that's here. Nothing much. Anyways, organizing data. Chapter two. All right, so we saw that back in um, chapter one, the definition of stats is how to collect, organize, analyze, and interpret. And in chapter one, it was all about collecting data. All right, so what we saw is um, some basic definitions in section one, one, and eventually in one, two. We started out with the individuals. The example they used is if you're interested in um, People who have climbed Mount Everest, the individuals are the people who have actually climbed it. Variable is of some characteristic about them, their age, their gender, their nationality. Now, that variable could be quantitative or qualitative. It could be numerical, quantitative, or it could be just some description, like, say, the sex, male or female, or their um, nationality. So it could be a number or it could be just some descriptive um, description about them. Um, if you're taking all of the data of all the um, information about everyone in a particular data set, you have a population. Now, a population doesn't have to be the population of the United States. If I'm talking about some characteristic some data about a class, our population could be just our class. Uh, or I could take a sample. I could just take the um, first four people alphabetically and not consider the entire group. If I'm taking data from a population, it's known as a parameter. And if the data comes from just a sample, which could change depending on which sample I take, you've got a statistic. Levels of measurement, normal, just a level. I'm sorry, just a label. Ordinal, um, when you're doing this, you start out with nominal. Everything falls into a, a nominal level of measurement. It'll meet, If it meets that it, and you try ordinal, ordinal, I can uh, put them in order. And the examples of this, the basic examples, is one star, two star, three star, good, better, and best. We also talked about um, GPAs of, of students at a particular college. The idea, it's, it's a label. You know, Joe had a, say, a 3.5 GPA and Sue had a 3.4. But the difference is, all right, when we're talking ranks in class, first, second, third, and fourth, People that um, the first four or five people could have a GPA close together, and then further down the list, the GPAs could be uh, a widespread. So you can order them, but differences don't make it diff uh, not meaningful. Interval level of measurement, yeah, I can. The label, yes, I can order them, but in interval level, there is no zero starting point. All right. Um, a classic example is temperatures. All right. It's incorrect to say when it's 40 degrees Fahrenheit, it's twice as hot. No, it's 20 degrees warmer because there is no zero starting point. If um, data meets the nominal, ordinal, and interval, then it has to fall into the racial level of measurement. And I'm thinking of um, distances. Uh, 100 miles is twice as long as 50 miles. Money is another thing that falls into the racial level. If someone makes $15,000 a year, they make half as much as someone who makes $30,000 a year. The racial level of measurement. Sampling techniques, here again, we're still collecting data. We could use convenient sampling. It's not too reliable, but it's convenient. Systematic sampling, we start with the, the people or objects that are already lined up, and we pick every fifth one or every sixth person in line. Stratified and cluster, use simple random sampling. The idea is, you know, simple random doesn't apply to convenience or systematic, but does apply to stratified and cluster. Stratify, you take the, the uh, data and you, uh, they're self, the strata self-identify. For instance, the classic example is a stratified uh, sampling would be, uh, take a high school where you've got freshmen, sophomores, juniors, and seniors, and all freshmen share something in common. They're the first year of high school, sophomore, second year, and so forth. And then once you identify the strata, something that these groups have in common, you take some simple random sampling and you take X amount of people from the freshman class, X amount from the sophomore, senior, and junior. Cluster sampling, kind of similar, st clusters and stratified. But the idea of a cluster, you do simple random sampling first. 
And the example I used is with the counties in Massachusetts. I number them all. I randomly uh, take a, uh, I randomly select three or four of them. And then once I select those clusters, I survey everybody, everybody. So simple random sampling is used within stratified and cluster. So I can't very well give you a question where the answer is simple random because if it's cluster or stratified, it, also, it always already contains the simple random sampling. So this is all about collecting data. Now that we've collected the data, we want to be able to organize it. So please take it a moment, not a moment, but please do not sleep on this video. It's about 37 minutes long, all right? Please make sure you're watching this. You may need to watch it, watch it more than one time. Just as an aside, we hear the words, we hear the name Florence Nightingale. Most people would think of nursing. But in reality, she was actually a pretty uh, passionate and relevant statistician. She viewed stats as a science. And um, the key thing here with Florence Nightingale is that back in the uh, Crimean War, Back in the uh, 1800s, she would use she used charts and diagrams, and she helped improve sanitation within these hospitals um, during the war. And the remarkable thing, if you look at this last this last paragraph, when re sanitary reforms she recommended were instituted, the mortality rate dropped from a staggering 42.7 percent down to 2.2 percent. A lot of it had to do with people just washing their hands and making sure that they were um, sanitary. As we think of what's going on now with the coronavirus, one of the key things is people are saying, hey, wear gloves and wash your hands, something that Florence Nightingale knew about way back when in the 1800s. All right, so when it comes to organizing this data, you've got bar charts and pie charts and all sorts of line graphs. Um, which one is best? Well, the idea is there's no really saying this one's better than the other. When you're given the task of putting some data together, your main objective is to portray it in such a way that whoever your target audience is understands what it is you're trying to promote as clear as possible. As we all know, we've seen some graphs in newspapers and magazines that are very clear. We look at it, we go, yeah, okay, I get what's going on here. And sometimes you, it leaves you scratching your head. You don't know what the author intended. Uh, saying it with pictures, we look at this fuel economy here from 1978 to 1985, fuel economy for autos. And here we've got um, sort of a line graph here. Now, this one... To my, in my estimation, this is a little clearer as we see as the years went on. Fuel economy increased from 18 miles per gallon in 78 all the way up to 27.5 in 85. This does the same thing, but maybe not as clear. But here again, it's up to the individual who is putting together, displaying this data, just how he or she is going to portray it. Unless you're working for a company and your boss says, well, I want a specific. Which one is better? Hard to say. Hard to say. All right. So in collecting data, we've done that. Now we want to organize. And the idea of organization is to take this raw data and to make some heads or tails out of it. All right. So here we'll, what we've got is a task force that wants to encourage carpooling to study of one-way commuting distances of workers in downtown Dallas. They took a random sample of uh, 60 of these workers, and the distances that they commuted to work are illustrated in this chart. You know, what we need to do, what we want to do is to create what's called a frequency table. We want to partition this data into classes or intervals and show how many data values fall into each class. All right, so we want to uh, organize this. Right, we've collected it, now we want to organize it. One of the ways of doing it is to make what's called a frequency table. All right, so we start out by organizing all of this data into smaller intervals called classes. And then we count how many data values fall into each class. For instance, here, um, people that travel between one and eight miles to work, there were 14 of them. And we talked about class boundaries. 
in the second column, and we also talk about class midpoints. We'll talk about that in, in a moment. All right here, the tally system. I took the raw data. They found that there were 14 people that traveled between one and eight miles, 21 people. I had a commute from nine to 60 miles and so forth. All right. Organizing this data. To create a frequency, a frequency table, he says, first we have to decide how many classes we need. And he says this, in general, five to 15 classes are usually used. If you fewer than five are used, you risk to lose, you risk to, uh, the loss of too much information. If you have more than 15 classes, the data may not be sufficient to summarize. So you can see you have some latitude here. All right, so that brings up a question. On an exam, would I ever give you some bunch of numbers and say, hey, make a frequency table? Well, not really, because one person may pick five classes and one may pick 15. What I'll do is give you the frequency table, then I'll ask you specific questions about that table. I won't ask you to take raw data and create your own. Here again, I've mentioned before that the exams are all multiple choice. There are no fill-ins. Okay, he says, let the spread of the data and the purpose of the frequency table be your guide. In this particular case, um, the author decides to use six classes for these commuting distances in the Dallas area. He says, next we need to find what's called a class width. The class width is going to be the difference between every one lower bound and the next lower bound, or one upper bound and the next upper bound. Next slide will show you what I mean by that. All right, class width. We take the largest data value, in this case here, the longest commute. We subtract the smallest data value, the person who had the shortest commute, and we just divide it by the desired number of classes. And we've chosen six, or the author chose six. He says, if you get a decimal, he says, um, make sure you round it up to the next whole number. All right, so the person who had the longest distance to commute was 47 miles. Person, the shortest to be was one mile, subtracting, dividing by six. We come up with a class width of eight. Notice the, the um, quotient here was 7.7. .7. We rounded up to a nice whole number eight. All right. All right. He says the lower class limit is the lowest data value that can fit into a class, and the upper class limit is the highest value that can fit into a class. All right, so once again, he says the lower class limit of the first class, the person who had the shortest commute was one mile. We take that one, we add the class width of eight. So the second class is going to begin at nine miles. So we follow that pattern and we establish all of the lower class limits. And we find the upper class limits so that the class span the entire range of data. All right, so here it is. The first person had the lowest, the shortest commute was one mile. We decided that we needed a class width of eight by taking 47, subtracting one, dividing by six. So the second class limit begins at nine, second lower class limit, then eight more than that is 17, and 25, 33, and 41. Well, if the second class starts at nine, we stop the first class or the upper class limit at eight. And here again, uh, the class width is eight. The class width is the difference between any one lower and the previous lower, or any one lower and the next lower, or take any one higher upper class limit, and the difference between the previous one. These class widths are a standard. They never change, right? They never change. In this particular case, the, um, the, um, the eight the class width. I say now we are now we're ready to tally the commuting distances. Go back to the chart and find out, hey, how many people actually traveled between one and uh, eight miles to work, or from nine to uh, sixteen miles to work? And what we're using is the slow tally system. All right, one, two, three, four, and then the fifth one is a, uh, a uh, slanted line. All right, so here what I did is took the raw data and I just circled the commuting distances that fell between one and eight miles inclusive. If we count it, I've got three there, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. You were fourteen. Fourteen people had a commute between one and eight miles inclusive. 
9. There it is, 14. Do the same from 9 to 16. Got 21. People that commuted between 17 and 24, there were 11. Followed by 6, 4, and 4. Now, while I'm at it, let me just talk about class midpoint. Sometimes when we're um, constructing these uh, frequency tables, we label them with a class midpoint. There's no right or wrong way of doing this. It's all the, you know, the other person that's putting together the table to be uh, portrayed to your client or to your boss or whatever. So sometimes we use class midpoint. And all the class midpoint is is take the lower class boundary, add the upper one. It's halfway between 1 and 8. Well, 1 plus 8 is 9. Half of 9 is 4.5. You know, 9 plus 16 is 25. Half of that is 12.5. But notice, once I got the first one, all I need to do, I knew the class width was 8, 4.5. If I add 8 more, it's 12.5. 8 more than that is 20.5. And then 28.5. And 8 more, and then 8 more. There's no need of, you know, taking, if you're doing the whole frequency table, is to, you know, average out all of these. Once you know the first one, simply add the class width. You know, for instance, on an exam, I may say, hey, for the class from 33 to 44, what's the class midpoint? Well, there's a case where you take 33, you add 44, you get 73, divide that by 2, hey, 36.5. Class midpoint, halfway point. All right, so there it is, the midpoint. You take a lower class limit. You add the upper class and you divide by two. You're finding a midpoint, halfway point. Pretty straightforward. Doesn't get much straightforward than this midpoint of a class. All right, here they are again. I just went through that. Now, this idea of class boundaries. In bar graphs, there are always a space between the bars. We're going to construct something called a histogram. And in a histogram, there are no spaces. I bet a histogram isn't any better graph than a regular bar graph. It's just another type of bar graph where there's no spaces between the bars. To alleviate those spaces, we find what's called the class boundaries. Very simplistic. What we do is take the lower class limit. In this case, 1, we subtract 5 tenths to get 0.5. We take the upper and we add 5 tenths. The same thing happens here. If you subtract 5 tenths from the lower, you add 5 tenths to the upper. Notice, eight, this one ends at 8.5. This one starts at 8.5. So what we've done is a lead to alleviate the space when we construct what's called a histogram. It's just a bar graph that doesn't have any spaces between the bars. And we accomplished that by subtracting 5 tenths from the lower, adding 5 tenths to the upper. Class boundaries. Occasionally, we're interested in percentages. Uh, we'll call them relative frequencies. We know that 14 people had a commute between 1 and 8 miles inclusive. You may be interested in, hey, what's the percentage of those 60 people that commuted between 1 and 8 miles? Well, there were 14. That's my frequency was. is a total of 60 people. Converting 14 over 60 to a decimal, 0.23. And that'd be easy to change to a percentage by moving the decimal point two places to the right. 23% of the people surveyed, the 60 people surveyed, traveled between one and eight miles. Um, if we go down further down the chart, we find out that 18% uh, of the people, of these 60 people, had a commute between 17 and 24. Relative frequency. It's a percentage. It's a decimal, which we can translate to a percentage. There it is. We all know what that symbol means, approximately equal to. Obviously, 14 over 60 didn't come up with the exact decimal, so it's an approximation of the nearest. In this case, to the nearest 100th. All right, so there it is once again. It's just the same slide, pretty much repeated. All right, so this idea of histograms. Regular bar graph, you've seen these bar graphs in elementary school. All right, nothing wrong with this. This histogram portrays that data that was in that uh, visual chart, but notice there's no spaces between the bars. All right, and we accomplished this by finding class boundaries. Does it make it any better or any clearer? <laughs> That's up to the person looking at the data or the person creating, creating the histogram. All right, the whole idea is to make it as clear to the consumer, to your target audience as you possibly can. And whether you use a regular bar graph or you use a histogram, it's pretty much up to the person creating the, uh, the 
shots. Uh, histograms and relative frequency histograms provide effective visual displays of the data organized into frequency tables. In these graphs, we use bars to represent each class where the width of the bar is the class width. All right, for histograms, the height of the bar is a class frequency, whereas in relative histograms, the height of the bar is a relative, all right, it's a percentage. He's telling us how to go about it here. We have a horizontal axis and a vertical axis. All right, now, if you notice here, here we have a regular frequency account. Here on the, um, I'll call it the Y scale, we have the data as percentages, as decimals. Notice the graphs look exactly the same, all right, because it's the same data. Here we're using percentages or decimals, and here we're using raw account. Graphs look exactly the same. It says, notice the basic shape of the graphs is the same. The only difference is the vertical axis, so called the y axis. All right. This would be something that you would do on your own. I've actually taken the time. He's given us some frequency distributions here. He's asking us for to determine the class width, the class midpoints, and the class boundaries. Well, the class width, all I need to do is take this upper, subtract this up. So I to take this lower class limit, subtract the previous one, 14 minus 10 is 4. Or take 29, subtract 25, it's still 4. The class width does not change. All right? It's the difference between any one lower and the next lower, or any one upper and the next upper. Well, in all cases, it's, it's 4. All right, the midpoint. So all I'm going to do is take the lower class limit, add the upper class limit, divide by 2. Halfway between 10 and 13 is 11.5. Now, to find the remaining ones, yeah, I could take 14 and add 17 and get 31, cut that in half. But once I know this first one is 11.5 and I know the class width is 4, I'm just going to add 4 more, 15.5, 4 more, 19.5, 4 more, 23.5, and finally, Four more, 27.5. If you don't believe me, take 26, add 29. You get 55, cut 55 and a half, yeah, 27 and a half. But once you know the first one, just keep adding the class width and find all the remaining ones. The class boundaries, I'm taking the lower class limit 10, subtracting 5 tenths, I get 9.5. Take the upper, add 5 tenths. All right, once again, all I need to do here is well this remains the same because take 14 subtract 5 10 you get 13.5 now what happens here is that if that one ends and this one starts at 13.5 there'll be no spaces between the bars all right the next upper class limit is four more than um 13.5 or 17.5 and the way of looking at it is subtracting 5 10 from here you're adding 5 10 from to the upper and from the system all the way down those are my class Boundaries. The same thing happens with this next one. Class with suspiciously is four again. Um, midpoint. So all I'm doing is taking the lower class limit, adding the upper, dividing by two, finding the average three point five, four bigger, seven five, eleven five, and fifteen five. Class boundaries. I'll take two, subtract five tenths, take five and add five tenths. One point five to five five, five five to nine five. All the way down. Notice here again. The class width here, right, stays the same as the class boundaries. Doesn't change. Distribution shapes. Histograms are valuable and useful tools. If the raw data came from a random sample population values, the histogram constructed from the sample value should have a distribution shape that's reasonably similar to that of the population. Several terms are commonly used to describe histograms and their associated distributions. You have things that are mound shaped, symmetrical. A lot of our work deals with what's called normal distribution there. Mound shape or shape of a bell curve. You could have a uniform or, re or rectangular shape. Things could be skewed left or right. And refer to be something being bimodal, which two classes have large frequencies. All right, so here's an example of something that's mound shape or what's called a normal distribution. It takes almost the shape of a bell curve, uniform distribution. An example of this is um, if I were, let's say, to roll a die, you would expect if I roll a die maybe 10,000 times, 
the number one would pop up as many times as the number two, three, four, five, and six. The resulting histogram would be rectangular or uniform. Things that can be skewed to the left or skewed to the right. Take a moment. You may want to watch this video. All right. On skewness, bimodal. Let's say, for instance, I was um, going into a Dunkin' Donuts if I could. Um, this represents, the, these bars represent the number of people that were in Dunkin' Donuts at a particular time. Well, first thing in the morning, let's say 8 o'clock, a lot of people there getting their morning coffee. And then maybe around 1230, there's a, here again a lot of people in there because they're they're buying lunch or whatever, buy modal. There's two classes that seem to be extremely larger than the others. A lot of examples of this. And I'm not too sure what that is right now. Let me just take a moment to click on it. All right, so this is our skewness. All right, what I'll do is I'll post that just a little bit better. All right, you know what that was. Another chart, uh, household incomes, it's skewed to the right. Now, let me skew to the right, the tail. All right, this is the tail. It goes off to the right. Um, you see incomes of households. All right, peaking at around maybe thirty to thirty-five thousand. There's a few people out here making a lot of money. I guess it's the Jeff Bezos of the world. Skewed to the right. Skewed to the left. Heights of students: very few kids, very very tiny, and about 126 centimeters seems to be the most popular. Skewed to the. This is actually skewed to the left. Excuse me, I said right. Uh, rolling a standard die, um, that would give us a uniform distribution because each die has the same probability. We we'll talked more about that in chapter four. What's interesting here, I, I've got the, you would think that somehow births of children um, would be uh, some sort of a uh, bimodal or even a rectangular, but as we can see here, there are more people born in July than any other month in August and September. And fewer people are born in November and in February. Well, February, you would think of this as less days. Um, clicking on this link here, we'll talk about this as we get further down, actually in Chapter 4. Something called the uh, birthday problem. When you have a minimum of, say, 25 students in a classroom, um, it's a paradox. Paradox meaning with 25 students, there's a 50% probability that two or more students are born on the same day. Not the same year now, but I'm saying the same month and same day. You say to yourself, there's 365 days in a year. With only 25 students, is a 50-50 shot. In fact, when that number gets to be around 45 or 50, it's just about a sure thing that two people are going to have the same birthday. Um, again, we'll talk more about this. It's called a birthday problem. It's a paradox. You want to click on that. I'm not going to spend the time here talking about that. Other types of tables and frequency, frequency tables. Um, sometimes we're interested in what's called a cumulative. Sometimes we want to study cumulative totals instead of frequencies. Cumulative frequencies tell us how many data values are smaller than an upper class boundary. All right, and a cumulative frequency for a class is the sum of the frequencies for that class and all the previous classes. It's another way of portraying data. Right, we've um, collected it and we're organizing it. All right, an old jive does this. It's a frequency table all right, using cumulative frequencies called a old jive. And we're talking here about Aspen, Colorado, daily temperatures above 40 degrees. And um, above 40 degrees doesn't make it great for skiing. So what we did is construct a frequency, a cumulative frequency. There were 23 days where the temperature was range between 10.5 and 25. There were 43 days that it ranged from 25 to 35. Now, cumulatively, 
there were 23 plus to 43, 66 days where the temperature was at or below 30.5. The next frequency is 51. If I add 51 to the 66, I get 117. There are 117 days where the temperature was at 40.5 or lower than that. Cumulative, taking the frequency of whatever class you're talking about and adding it to all the previous classes. All right, so 151 days that the temperature was at 60.5 or below. Cumulative frequency. And we use an old jive to uh, portray that. All right, here's the old jive here. Cumulative frequencies, you can see 23, 66, 117, 144, and 151. Another way of portraying data organizing. You're going to be talking about the same things. All right. So, for point of wrapping this up, because, you know, we'll, it'll get more difficult, trust me, but I'm not going to scare you right now. Take advantage of the straightforwardness of what's going on. It's um, pretty simplistic. What is he asking for us here? He says lower class limits. Well, there they are. All right. Lower class limits. And then they'll ask us for the upper class limits. Well, there they are, 69, 79, so forth. Class boundaries are to get usually the space between any one upper and any next, the next lower is one. So what I'm doing to alleviate that space, I'm subtracting five tenths from the lower and adding five tenths to a higher, the higher. And I just uh, get rid of the space between the bars. So my class limits are you see them subtracting five tenths to, from, from 60, 59.5, adding five tenths to 69, the upper 69.5. Same thing happens here, here 69.5 to 79.5, and so forth. Subtract five tenths from the lower, add five tenths to the higher. Midpoint is the halfway point. You take the lower limit, lower class limit, you add the upper class limit and divide by two. And there they are, 64.5, and so forth. Now, once I know the first one, I realize that my class width differs between 70 and 60. Sometimes people want to say class width is nine. No, it's not the it's not the difference between any one lower and the next upper. All right, that's not any difference. It's not the difference between the lower and the upper. It's the difference between any one lower and the next lower, or any one upper and the next upper. It's not nine. A class width here is 10. So once I knew 64.5 was the class midpoint for the first class, all I need to do is keep adding 10 all the way down. There was no need to be taking 70 plus 79 dividing by 2. And when we got class with, we know that's 10. All right, it's not 9, it's 10. And reasons for constructing, you get a large data set. You want to summarize it. You know, you just can't give a person a bunch of information about the numbers. And tell them, hey, this is what's going on. You analyze the nature of the data or the basis for constructing graphs. And here again, I won't ask you to construct your own frequency distribution, but these are the steps that they take. All right, relative frequency is the class frequency divided by how many values total. This, in the case of the Dallas people commuting, the sum was 60. Of course, if you want to change that, you know, to multiply it by 100%. All right, so here we have uh, relative frequencies, all right, and it, so we have frequencies, and then this next one has relative frequencies. What's going to happen, you're going to see this, you know, he's not going to give you the total in many cases. So to come up with this percentage, you would have to know the total here. Total is 40. Well, 12 divided by 40 gives me point, uh, point three three tenths. All right, uh, 14 divided by 40. The closest percentage is 35, but you have to know the 40. And many times, that's the little piece he doesn't give you. But how hard is it to add 12 plus 14 plus 11 plus 1 plus 1 plus 0 plus 1 plus 40? All right. And you change that decimal by multiplying by 100% into a percentage. Cumulative. All right. We start out with the first class having a frequency of 12. Now, notice, in a cumulative frequency, it always starts out with the words less than. And it always starts with less than. The second lower class boundary. All right. How many were less than 70? There were 12. 
how many were less than 80? I'm taking the 12, I'm adding the 14 to get 26. How many were less than 90? I'm taking the 12 plus the 14 plus the 11. The cumulative is the value for that class plus all the preceding classes. You see, 37 plus one more is 38. 38 plus one more is 39. 39 plus zero is 39. 39 plus one more is 40. Cumulative. Cumulative. And there are the examples of all three. The frequency, a relative frequency, which is just taking this and changing it to a body by the number 40 in this case and changing it to a percentage. And then cumulative. But notice, cumulative always has the word less than. It always starts out with the second lower class. We've already seen class boundaries already. That is that. Pretty straightforward stuff. Anyways.